So it's great to be here with all of you. I thank Professor George. I mean, everything I hear is he, he's doing a great job and uh, creating a lot of enthusiasm and a lot more new people who are excited about being value investors. And of course, my friend Jeff. I got to tell you, I love Canada. And I've had this love affair with Canada since I was about 22 years old. And I came up here and I rode most of the Canadian railroad system. And in doing that, not only did I have a lot of fun, but I also learned a lot about your country. And I ended up then, when Canadian National Railroad went public, I was all over the IPO because I really understood you know, the underlying assets and what could be done. And when management said they could reduce costs and increase revenues, I knew they could do it. And there was a man named Paul Tellier who was just a fabulous um, CEO. And then, you know, one of the very early investments that Liz and I were involved in was a company called Pacific Forest Products, which was a timber company that goes back to the Confederation or went back to the Confederation of Canada and had all this timber on the island of Vancouver. And it was all on their books at cost. And the analysts just completely missed it. So it was a wonderful anomaly. And um, actually, a friend of mine, Jeffrey Scott, out in Vancouver had shown it to, to me and a whole pile of other annuals. And we ended up buying 20% of the company and stopping the merger. And, and it was fabulous. Anyway, I love Canada. There's, this is, I think this is a country of the future. And uh, there's so much to be excited about. And I think getting an MBA here, I think you're all going to get very rich. Um, so, you know, as Jeff talked about, I started, you know, at the very bottom, really getting hot dogs, and ultimately was chairman of the Board of Mutual. And I learned a tremendous amount of, along the way about investing in companies. And Canada was one of the first international places to come look. And the market here was very cheap, because you'd have the top 50 companies, and underneath those 50 companies, there were a lot of cheap stocks. Some of those anomalies no longer exist. Um, and we started Wintergreen, and the idea was to have this global footprint, because our view is the future is really beyond North America. And, you know, we really need to, you know, be trolling for, for values everywhere. Um, what we're going to do tonight before we do Q&A is we're going to go through a couple of examples. And I thought, and we thought that would make sense and be more interesting for you to look at some companies and to go through and then we'll, we'll tear them apart together. And these are companies that are in our portfolio that we are very enthusiastic about. And, um, and just to give you a snapshot of how we think and what we do. Um, we're going to start with a company called Jardine Matheson. Has anybody ever heard of Jardine Matheson? Well, you're amazing, but you know, you're the only one in the class. Okay, well, okay. <laughs> I should have asked you, are you from Hong Kong? Um, but almost no one's heard of Jardine Matheson. And it's a 178-year-old conglomerate. And in some respects, it looks like the old Canadian holding companies. But it's really a Western company in the Far East. And there's two public companies. They're Jardine Matheson and Jardine Strategic. They're both listed in Singapore. And there's a cross shareholding. And if you go to the next page, you'll see uh, you know, the, the structure and you know, the big investments that they have. And their key investments are Dairy Farm, Hong Kong Land, and Jardine Cycle and Carriage. And these are three really, really good businesses. So. What's so interesting about this company is they've got good businesses in a part of the world that's doing well. Dairy Farm is really a food retailer and, and very much consumer oriented. Uh, they've got 5,000 outlets and they're growing at about, in terms of outlets, about 10% a year. And their margins are actually better than Walmart's, better than Loblaw's. So it's a really, it's an incredible business. And then Hong Kong Land is basically the key, most prestigious property in downtown Hong Kong. And so ultimately, they've got some pricing power, 
and they've got, you know, what they say in real estate, it's location, location, location. And, and then Jardine Cycle and Carriage, they control a business called Astra. And Astra has 60% market share in the automobile market in Indonesia. There are 250 million people in Indonesia. And they basically bought this out of a distress sale. And Indonesia, I think the per capita income is about $4,000 per person. And it's essentially at the inflection point where people start buying more cars, more motorcycles. So Jardine has these three businesses that are wonderful gross profit royalties on the passage of time in the Far East, Greater China, Southeast Asia. They've also got a number of other investments, including Mandarin Oriental. And Mandarin Oriental clearly is affected by what's going on globally in terms of economics. But you all know the Four Seasons, which is a great Canadian company, which got taken out at a big price. And so the Mandarin has a lot of underlying intrinsic value when the world improves. And then there's a series of other businesses that do quite well. And so why do we like Jardine Matheson? What, what makes us excited? Now, obviously, they had very good earnings recently. You know, value investors aren't supposed to focus on the short run, but it's always nice when a company does well, even in a tough period of time. But Jardine has the three characteristics that we've learned through long experience that are critical. We call it the trifecta. And it was really my business partner, Liz, who came up with that word. And it's a gambling word. But the trifecta is when you have a business with good or improving economics. And that's really, really important. And I know it's, it's one of the lessons of uh, Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. Um, but if the business is getting better over time, margins are improving, um, that makes it a really compelling company to look at. And the second element is management. And if you've got management that's really good and really focused on creating shareholder value and working for all shareholders, it also improves your odds of long-term investment success. So Jardine, we think, has a, a management team that's focused on the long term and focused on creating more value for all shareholders. And they have a lot of their own money up. You know, one of the things we study is, how does management compensate it? You know, did they get it through options? Is it heads I win, tails I win bigger? Or is it that they actually bought the stock? And people behave very differently when it's their own money. You know. And then the third thing is the price. And as all value investors want to do is they want to get something for less than it's worth. And the basic you know, theory is obviously margin of safety and you know, taking advantage of Mr. or Ms. Market. Um, when you look at the chart for Jardine and you add up the value of the pieces and you do a look-through analysis on what these pieces are worth, either on a standalone, um, cycle and carriage, dairy farm, and Hong Kong land are all listed. So you could look at it that way. And, or you could look and see, what do you think these businesses are worth on an arm's length basis? And it's hard to know exactly. But either way you look at it, there's a big discount. So you've got the trifecta, good or improving businesses, management, and a cheap price. The underlying NAV, the asset value, of Jardine has compounded since 2004, we estimate, at about 23%. So that's a great compound rate of return. And there's almost no debt. And there's no debt at the parent company. It's very conservatively financed. And so we think that this NAV can grow over time. And if you're buying into a business at a 40% or 35% discount to what it's worth, and the underlying asset value is growing, that's very compelling. And so here you've got a company in a part of the world where you want to be, where the asset value is growing, and there's a big discount. So as a shareholder, it's, um, it's a wonderful thing. Now, like, how would you be holding common discount? Like, would this be that uh, maybe this discount will never be realized, I guess, uh, because of the holding company structure? Stay tuned, George. Good question. 
He's a smart guy. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see that you know, the, the two companies, Jardine Matheson and Jardine Strategic, periodically buy back their shares. And recently, with the very good results, they announced that they were going to buy back more of Jardine Strategic at a discount. And the discount was actually quite large on the Singapore exchange because it's fairly thinly traded. And so by retiring these shares, buying them back, and canceling them, it, it accretes for all shareholders. So that's why stock buybacks work. So, George, I think that they'll probably will be holding company discount. But as long as they do things proactively to create more value, narrow the discount, it shouldn't be forever. And if we can compound at uh, a handsome or pretty rate of return without leverage, that should be a very good thing. So now what we're going to do, just because it's... Yes, sir? I was just wondering that, let's say this is in, like in Singapore, how, are you, how do you verify the management's intentions other than like doing the annual reports or getting just... Like, how, how do you like verify the management's intentions? It's an excellent question. The company here, the, the management, is um, ultimately an old Scottish family. It's the same family that goes back to almost the founding of Hong Kong. And they've done a really good job. And if you, if you look at how they compensate themselves, how they compensate management, and their acquisitions, divestitures, they've really been extremely conservative. And they haven't been speculators. And so, you know, over time we've studied the company and we've, we believe that management is quite good. And their ultimate incentive is for the company to prosper. And they are not prospering. They're prospering ultimately by businesses that do well and a stock price that does well, not through, you know, funny games. And one of the reasons we like Jardine so much is it's incorporated in Bermuda, so Western laws, trades in Singapore. This is part of a, you know, a structure they created before the handover um, of Hong Kong back to mainland China. But it's really a Western company operating in greater China and Southeast Asia. So that's part of the reason that makes us comfortable is because it's their money, it's our investors' money, and the objectives are identical. Let's create wealth and become richer. And for us, our belief is the part of the world that you really want to be doing business in is the Far East. And the, the tricky thing and the hard thing, whether you're, you've got a Canadian passport, a U.S. passport, or even you know, a mainland Chinese passport, is who do you invest with and what companies do you invest with? And we think in this case, the Jardine management's really done a laudable job, and we hope they continue to do it for many years. And, and just this idea, just to, I mean, if you're mathematical at all, that you can buy something at a 35 or 40 percent discount to NAV, and NAV is growing at 20 percent plus, that's over time. It, you, know, you know, George makes a very good point that, you know, the discount narrows and they buy back shares. Well, that's a good thing. And um, so, yeah, we really, we're very, very interested in Jardine. I think it's a... Uh, it's our largest position. So, any other quick Jardine questions or? Yes, sir. So it only trades on, on the Singapore. Yeah, no ADRs. Why wouldn't you encourage them to trade on Hong Kong where they might achieve a better valuation? I think they they're more comfortable from a legal perspective um, that they're listed in Singapore. If it traded in Hong Kong, we think it would trade at a higher valuation. Um, you know, our orientation is longer term, and, you know, this is what they want, and this is the way they structure the business, and they control the company. Um, so, you know, in the long run, as long as the asset values grow, and they work at narrowing the discount, it should matter less that it trades in Singapore. But you're absolutely right. I believe that if it traded in Hong Kong, the discount would be narrower. Although there's lots of holding companies in Hong Kong that trade at big discounts but not too many with the quality of businesses that Jardine has. 
Mr. Stacy. So we figured before we talk about the next company, which is Nestle, we, we'd give you a little sample of the product. And, and, you know, part of the reason that we are so excited about a, a business like Nestle is we love, <laughs> we love pricing power. And you know one of the one of the key things. <laughs> now the chocolate bars are a distraction. <laughs> I probably should have done this differently, but uh, so. so 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 one of the things about the chocolate business and all businesses that we look for is pricing power and the ability to raise your prices over time. And if you think about it. Um, most currencies um, and most, most, most things over time cost more. You know, it's been a little different in the last couple of years with, um, with China and manufactured goods. But, you know, George, do you remember when you were a kid growing up how much a chocolate bar cost? Okay, so 20 cents. What is a chocolate bar today? Two bucks. Okay. So, you know, Jeff isn't that old. And, <laughs> and, and, no, really, he isn't. He's a young guy and, and a very smart guy. And so in the course of Jeff's life, chocolate bars have gone up somewhere between eight and ten times. And so, you know, we love it when we can find companies that have the ability to raise their prices. Because it, as a shareholder, it protects you. And it gives you the ability for higher profits, higher cash flows, and there are products like chocolate bars where you know kids in the future of all ages are still going to like chocolate bars. High probability. And, and Nestle has the ability to raise their prices. So there's at some point, either they'll make the chocolate bars smaller or they'll be three bucks. I'm sorry? Or both. And so we like businesses that have that underlying characteristic. So Nestle is the world's largest food company. And they've got wonderful positions in chocolate, in infant nutrition, so uh, you know, infant milk formula, pet food. People like their pets better than their relatives. You know, the dog does not care if you've had a bad day. The dog's very happy when you come home. Same thing, cats are a little more particular. But it's, it's a great business, and people are willing to pay more and more money to feed Fluffy um, you know, a really nice meal or a meal that's better for Fluffy. There are frozen meals. Coffee. Coffee is also a very interesting business. Um, you've got, um, obviously, the American Starbucks, and then you've got Tim's. Tim's. And Tim Horton has been just a huge success. And, and you know, what's it, what does it cost to buy a cup of coffee at Tim Horton's today? Okay. Well, you know, there wasn't so long ago that a cup of coffee cost 20 cents. And so you really want to be in these businesses that have the ability to raise their prices. Ice cream, same thing. Bottled water is tougher. And really where Nestle's headed is to be the premier health and wellness company. And they want to do this on a global basis. And about 40% of their sales are in emerging markets. So they didn't wake up yesterday and say, we want to be in emerging markets. They basically, 30, 40, 50 years ago, said, you know, we want to be in Malaysia. We want to be in India. And so, you know, where the most dynamic growth is in the world is in emerging markets, and Nestle's there. And they're shareholder friendly, and they've gone from a holding company structure, which we'll go through in a little bit, um, to a much more focused, dynamic company on the food business. They still have a big stake, 29.9% stake in L'Oreal. And L'Oreal is the French cosmetics company. They put a very modest sum of money in L'Oreal, I think in the 1970s. And it's just turned into, it's worth billions today. So they're, they're actually, Nestle are quite good investors. And if you look on the sales and the EBIT margin, you'll see the EBIT margin has gone up about 40% in the last five years, six years. And so it's very impressive when you see a company, especially a large company, that can get its margins up 
and grow sales. And they've done some of this through acquisitions, but a lot of it has been through internal growth. They've got a solid balance sheet and strong cash flows. And we love strong cash flow. I mean, again, when you think about the principle of margin of safety, the idea that you have more money coming in, that protects you as an equity holder or a bond holder. And so in the case of Nestle, they've got those characteristics. And they're earning this money all over the world. Obviously big in euros, big in US dollars, but all over the planet. So we, we term it streams of multi-currency free cash flow. And so you know when you go to sleep at night, you've got Nestle generating more cash in currencies all over the planet. So even if you have one currency that's depreciating and another currency that's appreciating, ultimately you've got Nestle working hard for you 24 hours a day. And then they've got lots of free cash flow. And you know there's cash flow that people talk about which isn't free. Free cash flow is you know, it's in your hands, and you can go do something else with it. And what has Nestle done with this free cash flow? They've done some deals, but what's so interesting is if you look on the next chart, they've retired shares, so they've bought back stock and retired it at a discount to what they and we think it's worth. They've paid more dividends, so that's a beautiful thing too. So you get paid to wait. It's the old bird in the hand is better than two in the bush. And so even now, I think Nestle yields about 3% in Swiss francs. And you know, you get paid, what do you get paid in Canadian T-bills today? One, yeah, it's teeny, and in the US it's 10 basis points. So you can get paid you know, 3%, give or take, in a current yield, in a business that over time has become worth more and management's been proactive to make you richer. Um, and then the next sheet, this is how we've thought about the company. They used to have a very large stake in a business called Alcon. And Alcon was an ophthalmic and eye care company listed on the New York Stock Exchange. They had about 77% of it. Again, it was one of these, they put a little bit of money in, it became worth a ton of money, something like $20 billion, a lot of money. And they ultimately determined that they should, instead of having this holding company discount, as George uh, referred to, um, and it's an ancillary business, that they should um, sell the Alcon. And they did it in two steps to Novartis, which is another Swiss company, a big Swiss pharmaceutical company. So what we would do is we would look at the price at which Nestle would trade, especially after the markets came down. We would strip out the Alcon. We would strip out the L'Oreal, which is public, so you could see what price it is. We would strip out the cash and the free cash flow. And we'd see that we were basically, here it says 10.7 times, that moved all over the map depending on where the pieces were trading. But you were basically able to buy one of the best companies in the world with one of the best managements, with a good yield, at a very reasonable price. And in fact, we think a cheap price. So, you know, in retrospect, I wish we bought even more Nestle. Um, but this was basically a relatively simple analysis. But the funny thing about being a value investor is oftentimes it's not that complicated. <laughs> you know, it's actually just, you know, think independently, do the work and you can buy a company at a very reasonable price. And despite the fact that all this information was available to everybody, and it was on their website, it was, you know, people just didn't do the math. And most analysts would say, oh, you know, we don't know when Alcon's going to happen. We don't know if it's going to happen. And so there was this tremendous skepticism, yet management had been really quite clear that their intentions were to do what was right for the shareholders. So that's the analysis. And still, you have that Nestle trades at a discount to the other big food companies. So despite the fact that they've 
sold off non-core assets, bought back lots of stock, raised the dividend, it still trades at a discount. So we're very happy about that because then we don't have to trade out of the stock and you know, hopefully we can own it for you know, many years and it can be you know, a compound money machine for us. And you know, that's really you know, our objective at, at Wintergreen is to find these good long-term investments. And if you look at who's really gotten rich around the world, it's generally been people who've owned all of or a piece of a business held for, for years. And that's been, you know, here in Canada or wherever. Yes, sir? Uh, just taking a look at the, uh, the valuation you're mentioning. I see it's trading at a discount. Yep. I'm wondering if you think that's because of, uh, look at the, the multiples for Nestle compared to the average. Yep. Yep. It implies that the growth in Nestle from, let's say, 2010 to 11 is yep. much less than, than the average. Yep. I'm wondering if you feel that that's the reason for the discount or if there are other factors. I think there are other factors. I mean, they've actually grown over time more than a lot of the other companies. I, I think there's such an obsession with the short term in general, wherever in markets, and there are very few longer term investors or people who can sort of um, think about that chocolate bars go from 20 cents to two bucks. And so, uh, and you know also the street, whether it be the street in Zurich, <laughs> Bay Street, Wall Street, it's, you know, there's a huge incentive if you read uh, sell-side uh, literature that they want to generate a trade. You know, unless there's a commission, there's really no reason. So oftentimes somebody would say, oh, Danone is going to be better in the next six months. And we've seen that. Sell Nestle by Danone. But we think over the long term, you know, Danone will be fine, but we think Nestle has a great future. So. Yes, sir. I'm kind of curious about your screening process because, well, fine, maybe Jardine isn't really well known here, but they've all called council. Maybe everybody knows Nestle. It seems that both Jardine and Nestle isn't one of the typical, uh, you know, out investment companies. It probably does have a low PE, I would, I would imagine. It's probably have a huge market capitalization, and as I said, both of them are pretty famous. So I just want to know your screening process. Well. well you know, I think Jardine probably has a pretty low PE, and it's and you know, but it's it's basically, you know, we're not just obsessed with low PE investing, um, and you know, Nestle is well known, but not necessarily well understood. Better understood today than it was six months or a year or two years ago. You know, what we're really looking for when we think about these businesses that we invest in are companies that have the ability to do well over time in almost any environment. And, um, and we've especially tried to find companies that have this global reach. And you know, the gentleman in the red hat up on the corner asked the question about management. And if you can combine those two and, a, and an attractive price, you just, you're, the odds of success go up. And so you know, the funny thing is sometimes it's small cap stocks that are cheap. And what we found the big anomaly now is that there are large companies of great quality that have not participated as much in the rally because people have gravitated towards um, more speculative securities. So it's work. You just turn over a lot of stones. You know, I don't know. You know, maybe this week we'll find something wonderful here in Toronto and, uh, you know, it'll be in the portfolio, you know, get really excited, you know. But it's also, it's also, the other thing is companies that can change over time. And, you know, there's so many examples of businesses that were once great that are gone. And, you know, here in Canada, there's a company called Thompson Corp. And the family was brilliant, or, you know, the management was brilliant at saying, you know what, we're going to get out of the newspaper business. And they were way ahead of the curve. And they realized, you know, the future was going to be electronic publishing. And they did it. And then they bought Reuters, or they merged with Reuters. And so, you know, we're also, we focus on change. Who has the ability to change over time? You know, the buggy whip business was a great business. And there's so many businesses that value investors loved over the years. 
I don't know. But you know, Thompson, like you mentioned Thompson, Thompson has done nothing for the last 10 years. Why, the, I mean, I, I really like Thompson myself too, but I don't know why the markets have not really realized the potential of this company now with the switching the electronic uh, world. You know, I'm, I'll give you Tom Glauser's telephone number. He's the CEO, and he could give you, I mean, tell you why he thinks it's going to be great. And, you know, there's times where market prices and underlying values are disconnected for long periods. I think Thompson, you know, one of the challenges, it's, you know, it's here in Canada. It's not as well known. But, you know, I, I cite them as an example of a company that's really changed. I mean, there's so many media companies that we followed over the years that we were enthusiastic about where, you know, the business is just not as good as it used to be. So the screening process is, look, you know, Hong Kong's been a great city for a long time. But what's happened in Asia, it, you know, it's happened in the last 20 years in a big way. And so, you know, that's part of the reason that we've changed to look for, you know, gems like Jardine in the Far East. Yes, yes sir. Uh, So Nestle had several controversies that are regarding their practices and everything. Like, do you con you didn't consider those important when it's a conglomerate? Is it? You didn't think that would affect the price or whatever in the long run? You know, it depends on how big the risk is. And it depends on, you know, how, you know, I think that there was a problem. There, there have been various problems. I mean, almost every business has issues over the years. And I think it's how do they deal with the issues and do they move on? And, you know, if there's an issue that's basically terminal, then you've got to get out. And, you know, when we're talking about the newspaper business, that was terminal. The Internet was terminal to the newspaper business. And we used to be huge investors in that sector, and we realized that the thing to do was to get out. And there were very few people who were the proprietors, like the Thompsons, who got out of the business. Um, and then, you know, companies always have problems. There's recalls, and depending on how a company, you know, handles the PR, makes its customers happy, and, uh, you know, they move on. Toyota is an example, I guess. How are you going to do it now, Toyota? You know, I don't know. I, you know, I'm not Toyota's, you know, and to, you know, Jardine has exposure through, to Toyota through Astra. I think that, you know, hopefully they'll fix it. And, uh, you know, they'll fix their image problems. And, you know, hopefully they'll go back to being a, you know, quality manufacturer. Um, honestly, George, I don't know. You know, I, you know. But I think that certainly they have, they, their attention is now focused on whatever issues they, they've had. And, um, and hopefully for them that they'll, they'll resolve it and move on. And, and as long as they produce a quality product, people will go back. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that Audi had a problem. And, you know, people at the time were very, very negative on Audi. And, um, and they make a great product now. So I think it really depends. It comes back to that principle of, you know, who are the people running it? How do they deal with problems? And, you know, there's always challenges in life. And it's the question is, what do you do to solve the problem? And hopefully, for Toyota's sake, they solve the problem. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, I'm just wondering how do you basically value the company with a large amount of goodwill on their uh, balance sheet? Like, do you do sensitively on that, or like, do you just tend to avoid it? Well, goodwill is an interesting thing because sometimes there's goodwill and what I like to call bad will. <laughs> and you know, there's it's it's very very exciting for companies to go do acquisitions. And, you know, I think the history, and there's been, I think, a lot of academic study on this, that the history of, of acquisitions isn't so good. So there's a lot of companies that have gone out and bought things, and then what they've bought really doesn't have value. And then there's other examples of companies that have, you know, long acquisition records that have been good. You know, you know Berkshire Hathaway. Berkshire Hathaway has done a lot of deals. They've done some bad deals, too. I mean, Dexter Shoe did not work out. Um, so... I think that if the underlying businesses that are acquired have cash flow and free cash flow, 
then the goodwill is good. And proper companies and proper accountants have to do a test every year. Um, but if the business, if they're, you know, remember in the, uh, it, it, there was a boom in high tech and people did all kinds of deals. And a lot of that stuff ended up blowing up. And so a lot of that goodwill is wallpaper, you know. If you go every now and then, you can find like a, somebody who deals in old securities, the, the certificates, and you'll see there's so many companies that, you know, they don't exist anymore. And so I think you need to have, I think free cash flow is a very safe way to decide whether goodwill is impaired or it's good. You know. And for many years, you know, the media companies would acquire other media companies and they'd have lots of goodwill on their balance sheets and amortization. And, you know, the analysts gravitated towards EBITDA. And that was fine. But as soon as the cash flow started to decline, the goodwill was no longer. And then sometimes you have big book value, big tangible book value in assets. And that ends up being worthless. I mean, there's a lot of paper mills in northern Ontario, I think, that are closed. And they were once on the books, and there was lots of assets that were put in at you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. It wasn't that long ago somebody tried to get us to buy one, and I said, uh, no, no, thank you. <laughs> so, you know, I think what you really have to do, and the, the key thing, and I'm sure that Professor George does this brilliantly, is to focus on the quality of the business. And, you know, Wayne Gretzky, the great Canadian philosopher, talked about skating to where the puck is going to be. And not that anybody necessarily can foretell the future, but you really have to be paying attention to what's happening now. And, you know, if, you know, the paper business, I used to love the pulp and paper business, you know, or I like the trees especially. But, um, but you know, when, the, when you start seeing the consumption of paper decline, you got to worry about the paper mills. So, yes, sir? So you were talking about how Thompson was smart to get into the business that was terminal. Yes. yes. Um, I'm not an expert on tobacco companies, but yeah. they could be terminal. Um, why, does, why do you like tobacco companies? Well, you know, we don't advocate smoking. And the thing about cigarettes is that even though, you know, when people are educated, generally they smoke less of them. And, you know, they know the health warnings and they don't uh, consume cigarettes. What's happened in Canada is a real lesson in this is that, um, even though taxes have gone up, prices have gone up, and cash flows have gone up. And so um, it's still a profitable business. And it's a business, again, with a lot of pricing power. And so that's, that's why we're mostly interested in it, is that lots of free cash flow and pricing power. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, so these, uh, just to be curious, these two yes. Yes. examples, They've got a lot of history behind them. The numbers are there in terms of assets and cash flow. Um, I was going through your annual reports, and uh, in 2006, you had bought Google at around 500 or so. So sure. about a year, a year and a half later, you had uh, sold it anywhere from 450 to 650 or so, and in that range. Yep. And uh, I was wondering, um, how did you rationalize that investment? Because most value investors, the only value investor I know that bought that was Bill Miller. Okay. Why we bought Google <laughs> was once we realized, you know, that the, that the newspaper business and a lot of the traditional television businesses were basically in steep decline, realized Google was, was essentially, they were, the, they were the terminator effectively. And what you could do with Google is you could back out the cash that was on their balance sheet. And they had various other investments. They invested in dark fiber and a few other things. And it was 50 or $75 a share. And there was at one point, Google dipped. And I, don't have the, I, don't have my, I don't have the trade records in my head. But we, we were actually, I think, setting up the core Google business at a very, what seemed to be a very reasonable multiple. And then when it moved up, and we thought it became expensive, we traded out of it. Um, but basically, we thought it was a relatively, it was an opportunity. But you know the swings 
in sentiment, in general, in securities are wild, as we know in the last couple of years. But the sentiment swings in Google were also almost profound because people would say, oh no, it's all over. And people would rush for the exits. And so we have a tendency of you know, shopping on the new low list, the gentleman who asked about the screening process. But we've become, over time, more and more interested in better quality businesses. Um, you know, we have bought companies that are just cheap or the assets are just cheap. But you know, we believe we live in a world where your dollar or your euro um, or your, we used to be, whatever, you know, actually purchases less. And so that's why you know, we, we have obsessed with these businesses that have the ability to raise their prices. And Google, you know, what they were doing was they were doing, they were getting you know, banner ads and they were figuring out all kinds of ways of getting not only more of the media dollars, but, and so it just seemed like a great business. But at a price at which it was, no, it was a great business but it wasn't a cheap stock, we got out. And you know, I think that as a value investor, one of the challenges is selling. And you've got to sell if you know, the facts have changed um, or something becomes really expensive and it no longer fits your criteria. And in the case of Google, it was cheap for a nanosecond and then it went up and we got out. So, yes sir? How often do you evaluate the stocks in your portfolio just so that you know where you are compared to just value? Is it just when the facts change or do you do it on a... About three times a day. <laughs> just, no, I, mean, you know, we, I really think about this a lot. Um, but you know, we really do think about the companies and you know, what's changed and you know, is there something either that's good or bad that's occurred. And you know, we're willing to, um, you know, if the fact pattern changes, is to sell. And then you know, one of the things that we've done in this period uh, because you've had this huge disconnect between quality and everything else that we found we've sold some companies and we bought other companies that we thought were really undervalued. And so, you know, you know, I look through the run all the time. Folks I work with, our team thinks about these companies. And if something's changed, you know, we're inclined to do something about it. But ideally, ideally you invest in businesses where you know, Nestle's still going to make great chocolate bars in 50 years. But if they had gone out and done something that we didn't agree with with the capital, we probably would have sold the stock. Just as a follow-up then, the opportunity cost of being in that stock for a long time, especially if the company is uh, not liquid or have that longer uh, discount rate. Right. Versus investing in something that the market is going to realize sooner their intrinsic value. How do you evaluate that? You know it's hard because you've got to be careful that what the market is enamored with at whatever moment in time is usually very dangerous. You know, again, I go back to one of the last big bubbles, which was in 2000. And if you didn't own technology, you were a dinosaur. And you know, the opportunity cost of owning uh, conventional real companies was huge. Because not only did they go down, everybody who was invested in you know, dot com was getting rich. And so one of the, the, the tricky things is to figure out, you know, is the underlying company good, is the underlying business good, and the stock price, as George was talking about, doesn't do anything, or do you own something that's a value trap or dead? And if you've got something that's, you know, no good, you know, that's part of your job is to evaluate it. And it's not a perfect thing, um, but, you know, we're always looking, can we find something better? Is there a better idea? Can you screen and find something better? Can you read more annual reports and find something better? We have a wish list. So when we've got um, companies that we'd love to buy, but trade at a price which is too high. It's like going to the store. You know, let's say you want to buy you know, a new, new set of clothes. And you just wait until you know, the after Christmas sale. 
And it's the same thing with securities. So what we really do is, you know, we have a list, we have the dream list, and then it's, it's today it's really pretty easy because you can set, you know, um, you know, on the computer what prices you care about. I'll give you an example. There's a company called Rishma. Has anybody heard of Rishma here? Oh, good. Okay, well, you have, Jeff, but you, you're smart. You're very smart. <laughs> so, actually, Jeff and I have talked about the company over the years. Rishma is a, um, is a holding company for a series of luxury goods, especially Cartier. And Cartier, they spun off, they spun off another business, and Rishma, in this panic, the stock price went down a lot because people basically felt that no one would ever buy another piece of jewelry. That not another man would fall in love with another woman. <laughs> that not another guy would want a Cartier watch. You know, but this is the way the mentality becomes. And so what we did is we looked at the underlying value of Rishma. And you had... Um, um, cash, I think it was a billion Swiss francs in cash or more. You had the underlying inventory of this jewelry business and you could say, you know, <laughs> at that moment in time you maybe couldn't liquidate everything instantly, but over time you certainly could. And you had this underlying franchise that dates back to, I think it's 1757, going back to a lot of numbers in history, that's got give or take a third of the business in the Far East. So we thought that this was one of the best companies in the world that was trading up at a beaten up price, but we just waited. So we didn't buy it when everybody was super enthusiastic about luxury goods. We bought it when it came down. Actually, can we go to this gentleman first and then? Um, so you folks are talking a lot about your for great businesses and yeah. price impact. So does that focus preclude you from looking at, um, I guess, event-driven or special situations like merger or spin-offs or distress credits or whatever? I've done all three. I've done merger arb. We've done some, you know, in the last period of time, I think it was uh, consolidated energy or um, I've done a lot of distress in the past. And, you know, our view has been that, you know, there have been tremendous distress in the U.S., the challenge has been that a lot of the companies that got in trouble weren't, the, weren't great companies, and it was really a trade. And that instead of buying a trade, we could buy, you know, Rishma, which hopefully we can own for a really long period of time because, you know, it's a certainty that men will fall in love with women, you know, and that they will buy them all kinds of things. Um, and then, you know, we've certainly done some event-driven um, but, you know, our focus has increasingly been, just because of the period of time, that this is what we think is the great opportunity set. Um, at some point in the future, there'll be lots of deals to do. We'll come across another fabulous distress opportunity. Um, so, you know, we've got the tool set. But what we, we've tried not to do is just to tick a box. And remember, this is all our own money. And, you know, my friend, my, my friends, my family, and so we're just, uh, you know, we really try to be very conscious of our fiduciary duty. And, uh, but we think over time there'll be lots of things to do. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, besides the company that you mentioned, I uh, went to your website and see uh, you had an interview with the Bloomberg TV about Swatch. Yeah. And the commonality between these three companies, they are basically uh, industry leader in emerging market. Yeah. Yep. So um, from other, other stuff, uh, other, other transactions, are there any uh, mistake that you made that they <laughs> are market leaders, they are seem to have a very really nice management, but they didn't perform well? I've made a number of mistakes over the years. My most spectacular mistake was the privatization of the railroad infrastructure in the UK, and the British government basically took it private. And we made a lot of money, and we gave it back. And I learned a fundamental lesson is, you know, you really got to watch what governments do, and you don't always know what governments are going to do. Um, but so, you know, look, we're human, I'm human, we're going to make mistakes. What we try to do is learn from the mistakes. 
and you know, oftentimes, you know, write down what mistake did I, you know, why did I make this mistake? Why am I not going to make this mistake again? <laughs> and then you know, you have people around you who go, hey, <laughs> you know, that could be a mistake. You know, why don't you think about it? And it's very, I think, very important to be intellectually honest with yourself and to be surrounded by people who are honest. And we find even with management, going back to the gentleman up in the corner there, um, we like it when management's right, I made a mistake. <laughs> I was wrong. You know, one of the toughest things in any language on this planet for somebody to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. And it happens all the time. But we've learned, you know, in the case of Swatch, uh, Swatch, everybody's heard of Swatch, right? Swatch not only makes the low end, they make the medium end, Longines, and then they make the high end. And they've basically come out and said that they believe their results could be this year the best they've ever had. Now that's highly, highly unusual in this environment. And so here you've got a company with a great balance sheet, and they had the foresight to go to the Far East, I don't know if it was 30 years ago or you know, a long time ago, and build a distributor network and so we think it's a great company. And, um, and so you know, really that's where we perceive the opportunity today is that you've got these businesses all over the planet that trade at the wrong price. And they, they trade not only a discount to what they'll be worth um, necessarily on a trading basis, but also um, if they were to be taken over. But then you get the future for free. And we think that's the case with Swatch. We think we're going to make a lot of money. You know, you've got 1.3 billion people in China at least. If we could sell a Swatch to every single one of them, boy, that'd be good. You know, I mean, <laughs> and a chocolate bar, and and, it, and it's not just China. It's 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 all over the world. And um, and so you know, we find that being a value investor is an evolving process. You know, it's we're a long way from pulp mills to buying. You know. Industri you know, really the, the best industrial companies in the world trading at a cheap price. But it was the same idea that Ben Graham laid out. You know, even holding companies, George, it was the same thing, buying at a discount. It's just, you know, is it going to get collapsed and the value is going to grow over time? So. Oh, yes, sir. And is that a Cincinnati Reds hat? Yes, it is. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> uh, with having, with having a focus in, the kind of, in just the way that you invest and having sort of focus in a few companies, uh, we haven't talked about any of these kind of firms today, but assuming that you've held, held these in the past, yeah. Yeah. if you had a, you know, a high percentage of shares outstanding, and you're talking to the fact that if the facts change, then you know, you're out, uh, what's your, been your position on being, taking an active position in shareholding? Have you ever talked to management and said, okay, we're gone if you, uh, if you do this? We've taken a number, you know, at Wintergreen we've done it, in my previous firm, we'd done it. We'd done a lot of it. We did it here in Canada. You know, this whole Pacific Forest. Now, this is a, a bit of a stale. You know, this is a long time ago. But basically, we felt they were misbehaving. And we, uh, they tried to, there was a company called Avenor, which was the old, which was the renamed Canadian Pacific Forest Products, which goes back to my touring Canada by rail. So, um, and they tried to take Pacific Forest products private too cheaply. And you know, we'd done all this analysis of what, what we thought it was worth. And it was incorporated in British Columbia. So we read the corporate, the Company Act of British Columbia. And then I had my friend here to the left make sure that I was right on this, you know, talking about you know, doing the work. And we saw that if we owned um, I think it was over 10% of the company and the way they'd structured the deal, we could go for appraisal rights. So we bought 10% of the company. We owned 5%, we went to 10. And we did a public filing that said, and in fact, one of my dear friends, Karen Maid helped me do this years ago. And, um, and we bought 10% and the company was very upset with us. You know, because clearly they wanted to buy the assets cheaply. And so, long story short, half the board resigned, 
we went to 19.9, and ultimately we got taken out at a lot higher price. So the answer is yes. In the rice situation, we will absolutely do an activist situation. And you know, we think that people need to think like owners. And that's you know, the other big lesson that, you know, as, as the whole value investing uh, philosophy evolves, it's the idea that you know, you know, Buffett talks about you, know, you own not a piece of paper, but a piece of a business. And I think it was at last year's meeting, Jeff, that Buffett said if institutional investors stood up and said, enough of this, it would stop. So we think that we take our fiduciary responsibility very seriously. Yes, yes sir. So in order to find a business that really is, has a great business model that's sustainable, yeah. you need to really understand the business. And it seems like you are invested in a broad range of different businesses, different industries. So is there a business that you, an industry that you would be com comfortable investing in because you feel like you lack a like, specific understanding or what, are, what, is, what do you feel comfortable in terms of your experience? Where do you think you get special experience to actually make an investment? Well, I think that you, I think the best thing to do is to read a lot and study a lot and, um, you know, see, do you think the business has uh, got a competitive advantage and has the prospects of doing well in the future? Um, I think there are some businesses that, you know, I think technology, you know, there's some people who can do it. But it's so hard because every six months it changes. I just bought a new television set. You know, I was really excited about this TV. You know, it was the most beautiful TV I'd ever seen. Well, then I'm watching television, you know, the other night, and I see that there's now a 3D version of the TV. And I'm sort of annoyed with myself because, you know, it, within, within three weeks. And so I think, you know, technology really, it's just a hard business. And, you know, there are certain companies that have had, have been able to do great over long periods of time, but many of them, have just gone away. So we've shied away from technology. Um, you know, we've shied away from things like textiles, which is a really, really hard business. Um, y you know, you really want to own a business where, you know, there aren't a lot of competitors and that your weakest competitor is not um, going to just lower their price. The airline business has historically been one of the worst businesses on the planet. And lots of people put money in airlines anyway. Either they think that, uh, you know, whatever, it's going to make them, whatever. I mean, people put money in airlines, but it's really, you know, at the end of the day, they've got to fill those seats with people. And so the incremental cost of, you know, there's been points in time where the airlines have used you know, sold tickets below cost just to get the airplane up in the air. And so I think, you know, the airline business is one that you just, it's just miserable, you know. You know, if you, if you can own something that's wonderful, I mean, look, if you had a choice of owning something, gr a small amount of something wonderful or a large amount of something terrible, you should go for the small amount of something wonderful. Yes, sir. Do you find that sometimes you're limited because of the amount of capital you have to employ now in, in terms of found value plays and you just can't uh, go in and invest in there because there's just not, it's either not liquid enough or, you know, there's, there's too many of them. We have to spread the capital out it. The, uh, <coughs> I guess, non-systematic risk part gets diversified too much and you don't, you don't get to, to experience any gain on it, I guess. Or? You know, our view right now is that the, there's lots to do and that we could put more money to work. Um, because, again, it comes back to this quality differential that there's a lot of quality, but there's not, you know, the quality has sort of been left behind. You know, we've had experiences, I've had experiences in my uh, years ago where we had more capital than ideas, and either you let cash build up or you close. Today, that's not the case. I mean, we, we think there's so much to do in the world and you know, we're quite optimistic. Hey, look, I can't tell you what the stock market's going to do in the short run, um, but the gentleman who asked me about market caps, there's a lot of big liquid companies out there that trade cheaply. So, yes, sir. Um, going back to competitive advantage, yeah. um, 
Uh, when companies are based on operationally based competitive advantage, like when they have an operations based competitive advantage, how do you go about evaluating something like that? Like, would you look for hints in the numbers, or would you actually look at some of the processes more in depth? Well, you know, you try to see. You know, does the company manufacture? You know, if it's a manufacturing company, it's different from a a, a, d a different type of business. But in a manufacturing business, it's you know, do they make a high quality product? And I'll give you an example. Just you know, and you know, we own shares in the Schindler Elevator and Escalator Company. And you know, it's got cash, got a big smile in back, but yeah, um, that's fine. And uh, um, and the Elevator and Escalator Company has a lot of cash, and they make a real quality product. And you know, you can compare Schindler to Otis, you can compare it to Kone, and you know, they all do a good job. But you know, I find that you know, when I get a Schindler escalator, and, or I look at the elevator, and just how everything is made, and you can certainly study their margins, you know, I've been to the factory, it's just a super high quality company. And you know, when you look at it long term, you know, they um, won a piece of the um, Olympics in Beijing. And so, you know, they're perceived as a quality company around the world. And the world is becoming more urban. And so, you know, in that case, you know, we see that they've been able to go up against their competitors and sell. And they make a quality product. And they do it conservatively. So... No, it's, it's a great business. I mean, think about it. I mean, escalators. I mean, the world, the world can't live. Well, I mean, it can. But the world is a much better place with escalators. You know? <laughs> I mean, and even, you know, even in this building. I mean, it's a three-story building. And, you know, you're all really young, and Jeff Stacy is really young. Um, but, you know, I bet you the elevators get used a lot. And um, so it's a great business. And, you know, and you just want to see, you know, you know, do companies adopt procedures to, to incrementally become better and better? And so with manufacturing companies, it's reasonably easy to do. Now, you talked about, uh, before, about value traps. Yes, yes value, value traps. traps. How do you identify them? How do you protect yourself from <coughs> one in the value trap? You know, George, that's a great question, a second fabulous question. I mean, value traps are, it's very, very easy for value investors to buy into something that looks cheap and is built to stay that way. And, you know, what you've got to see, um, you know, there used to be a company that um, I followed a little bit called Hydraulic Press Brick. And Hydraulic Press Brick never went up. You know, eventually it got taken over. But it, the compound rate of return would have been terrible. And there's a number of businesses over the years that just, they just don't have uh, compelling economics. They don't have management that's working for you. I think some of it's experience. The airline industry, that's a, that's a good example of a value trap. Um, and then what you've got to do is see, do new businesses that were great or were reasonable become value traps? And I think you've just got to, you've got to follow the economics. And, uh, and some businesses, there was one I followed a long time ago called Sprouts Rights Stores. And Sprouts Rights Stores was a retailer with, I don't know if it was a thousand little stores throughout the west coast of the U.S. And you know the whole principle of net, net current assets where you take the value of the inventory, you deduct all the liabilities, you divide by the number of shares outstanding, and that was supposed to be a cheap thing. And it was cheap. And I used to call it the ladies' underwear and toothbrush net net. The problem is they went broke because you know, Walmart came along and other stores came along and um, it just wasn't, you know, no matter how statistically cheap it was, I'll give you another example, and hopefully this, uh, there's a company in upstate New York called the Genesee Brewing Company. And the Genesee Brewing Company had a lot of cash, they had other assets, I think they had a snack food business, and they had beer. The problem was, is that people stopped drinking regional beers, and they started drinking Budweiser. 
And so no matter how cheap Genesee was, their underlying business. So I think where I really focus is, you know, have things changed? And, um, and then, you know, after some period of time, George, you lose patience. It comes to the gentleman's question in the upper row, you know, the opportunity to cost a capital. And at some point, you know, if there's no debt, it's one thing. But if a company's leveraged and they're doing poorly, you can lose. So how long is your patience? Depends on the day, George. But uh, <laughs> I'm a pretty patient fellow. But, but I've learned over the years that the best thing to do when, when it's obvious that something's happened is to just get out. You know, especially if you can't do anything about it. And, um, or, you know, where it, the values become, the valuation becomes so high, or, you know, and our perception is so high that we think the risk exceeds the opportunity, so we'll sell. You know, you know that's why, in some ways, it's a beautiful thing if a company, you know, it comes back to the Jardine example, if the asset value can grow and there's still some sort of a discount, and they are buying back the shares to narrow the discount and to create the value, it's comfortable. <coughs> because, you know, if it goes to NAV, you gotta sell, basically. Especially if the pieces become expensive. Why, like, why in Jardine you look at NAV only? And then in uh, Nestle, you look at free cash flows. Why you didn't look at both of them in free cash flows or NAV? Is there a reason for that? I just thought that was a, you know, I wanted to have two different examples. And, uh, you know, we could look at free cash flow for Jardine as well. I think that, um, you know, one is a different structure business. One is effectively a holding company. And the other is an operating business that had holding company characteristics that were being dismantled. You know, I think one of the things that's a challenge is uh, that you don't always want to value everything the same way. Because some businesses, I remember in the, the heyday of, of mobile telephony, people would value everything on, on the basis of a pop or expected returns in the future. Um, well, that was a pretty different way. Uh, but we could have valued Jardine on free cash flow as well. So you use both of them? Absolutely. We'll, we'll, we'll do a number of different things. You know, I mean, you know, I think you've got to look at different businesses different ways. You know, in the case of uh, Schindler or Swatch, you know, they've got big net current asset positions. And, you know, most analysts look at that and they don't consider it in their valuation. Well, if they wanted to run the business that way, they could probably run down their inventory and, tr and translate that into cash. But that's not, you know, they're thinking long term. But we think that's a, actually a fairly liquid asset. So I think every situation is a little different, George. But um, you know, ultimately, you want to own businesses that generate, you know, lots of free cash flow and become worth more. Uh, how about the gentleman in the corner? Then I'll go to you. Yes, yes sir. John, correct me if, uh, if I'm wrong. Because uh, uh, I think your uh, value, invest, value invest approach starts from looking at uh, looking at management. Because in the Jardins business, I think they have 20% of the unit of wealth share. Correct. So I think that is a huge amount if uh, you can invest 20% in this kind of business. Because they have a family business and the uh, Rothschild family want to keep their business private. And that really says something about like um, Jardins uh, management's power uh, in this relationship with their family. So. Uh, Maybe I can assume that the Jardins management or the shareholders will have a good relationship with Rothschild family, right? And then if the Rothschild, if you know the Rothschild family, they have a, a business vision of uh, conservatism. So if they share the same similar business vision, you can also assume that uh, Jardins will have a conservative business, business growth approach. So with that in mind, you didn't look at uh, EPV more that in NAV because if you have a conservative business approach, then the value driver of your business will come from assets rather than your uh, earning powers, right? I think it's a very insightful question. 
Um, I think the fact that Jardine was able to buy a piece of Rothschild, which is an investment bank, a private investment bank, and that they had these connections. And I think the way it worked is Rothschild won exposure to Asia. Um, you know, I think it goes down to why you have to look at each one of these companies differently. I don't think there's a magic formula. And I think part of the reason that, you know, makes, makes value investing so interesting and, you know, what George is doing here, Professor George is doing here so fascinating is that you got to look at each one of these situations differently. And that what you're doing, which I really respect, is you're connecting the dots. And, you know, if you go back to, um, you know, security analysis or the intelligent investor, there's not a chapter on connecting the dots. But it's by connecting the dots sometime that lead you from one idea to the next or to figure something out that's not obvious to everyone. It's, it's a bit like screening. You know, the gentleman up there in the white T-shirt, he figured out how to connect the dots. Well, that's going to lead him to something interesting. And over the course of his career, you know, you'll connect the dots and you'll find some great investments. So, yes, sir. Um, sure. So Seth Parman uh, often talks about one of his greatest advantages being uh, his relationships with the sell side so that he sees uh, flows on things that he cares about. I was curious uh, to what extent do you use the sell side and what you also consider to be your greatest advantage? Uh, I have tremendous respect for Seth. Um, we are less enthusiastic about the sell side. Um, I think one of our competitive, our competitive advantages is that, you know, even though I have a, an American passport, you know, I feel like I'm a citizen of the world. And then I've been to a lot of places. And, um, and that we're willing to work on a lot of different types of businesses where it's not obvious that, you know, there's a lot of value there. Um, and I think the other thing is, is that we're really, we're really trying to think long term. And we think we, we live very much in a world where um, you know, trading is, is what's exciting. And you know, when we, again, we look at who has gotten really rich, it's you know, guys like Lee Kai-shing. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's you know, even the stock hasn't done anything. It's the Thompson family. And, you know, and I would bet you know, there's a high probability that most of the people in this room are going to do really well because you're going to take with your career a long-term view. And so I think that's, our, that's really what we're – and we have nice relationships with the sell side as well, but, you know, we're not trading. <laughs> we're, we like to accumulate really good things and keep them and then learn more about them and connect the dots. So, yes, sir. And uh, connected to that is the management's belief in terms of reinvesting the capital into their own business. And how do you, uh, or do you believe, you know, give cash to me and then I'm going to invest it into other stocks where I can? I, I think it's, it's, it comes back to a little bit what George and I were talking about before is I think it all depends on the situation. If the company can reinvest the capital at a high rate of return, you'd much rather have them reinvest in the business. If um, but it's beautiful to get dividends and capital growth, especially in a world where interest rates are low. You know, if you could get paid three or five percent to wait. You know, historically, uh, yields have been a big pro uh, proportion of the returns that investors have made. So I think it all depends. But dividends are a beautiful thing. Yeah. Yes, sir. And George made me think of this one, so blame, blame him on this one. Okay, so value, tra value traps to me seem more intuitively from my limited experience to occur uh, on like stocks that have a lot of focus, right? Because you know the market, because the market is, has looked at these and they've made their analysis and they've still concluded right. forces aren't there to bring it up. So just to take Nestle as an example, you know the map is readily available and the markets have, you know, they, they have seemed to place their understanding. So what makes you think that this wouldn't be a value trap or what would make what catalyst do you 
and expect to bring you know market values in line with what you perceive, what you guys perceive as an intrinsic value? Well, the two things that are I think are com key in Nestle is twenty cents a chocolate bar to two dollars a chocolate bar, and I think you know hopefully you'll remember this talk at some point in the future, and you'll go. Gosh, it's ten dollars for a chocolate bar. <laughs> you know, you know when you're buying chocolate bars for your grandkids. And I think the fact that they, that that business can <coughs> raise its price and sell more makes it unique. I think what's also interesting about a company like Nestle is they've done something about the holding company or the discount. They've sold an asset at a fancy price, you know, or at a good price, and they bought back a lot of stock. They paid a dividend, right? And they've retired shares. So they've done all three things that you could possibly want. What you don't want is a company, and I don't have a perfect example, uh, that goes and takes the money and goes off and does something wild with it. You know? It's happened a lot. <laughs> you know, in the course of, of history, uh, I remember once visiting a pen company. And the pen company raised all this money um, to invest in the pen business, and then they went and speculated in real estate and lost all the money. So, you know, that's not what you want. And you know, I didn't know going into it that they were going to speculate. And but you know, I walked. Visiting companies is a good thing. <laughs> I mean, have you been on company visits yet? Yeah, it's really you know you can tell a lot by going and visiting a company. Do, they, do you walk in and do they have a really fancy lobby? Do they have, you know, is it, you know, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, there's a company which will remain unnamed and we were involved in a shareholder activism situation. And we own a lot of it and they weren't behaving very well towards us. And um, I raised my hand at the annual meeting. On the way in I saw that there were a lot of Mercedes 450 SELs, like a whole line of them. <laughs> so I raised my hand at the annual meeting and I said, does everybody in the company get a Mercedes 450 SEL? The response was the next day from their attorneys, you know, we really like to negotiate to buy you out. <laughs> and, you know, and that was an example of a company that was, you know, they, their priorities with the cash flows and our priorities as a minority shareholder were not similar. And so, you know, ultimately, the thing to do was to go. Well, the thing, I mean, you may be saying that, you know, what's the value here? Like, why can somebody else go and manufacture chocolates? Why so? Can you can't do, do it, it George. Think about Nestle chocolates. George, you know, if we started George Chocolate Company today, and we gave you a um, billion or two billion dollars, um, it would take you a really long time in terms of goodwill and advertising to create that product. And so there's certain products like Coca-Cola, you know, I see a bottle of Minute Maid up there, that are very, very hard to duplicate. And part of it is consumer trust. Some of it is familiarity. You know, why has Swatch been so successful? Well, they continually create new models that people want to buy. But I think it's very, very hard to recreate a Nestle. I, I just don't think you could do it. You know, yes? So in value investing, we hear a lot about management teams being very important. And without having the ear of the management, how would you recommend methods for evaluating them uh, without the ability to call or go visit the company? You know, there's a lot that you can read in the public domain. Um, I think it's called the annual information form. You can read the proxy. Proxy statements are a fabulous way of peering into the minds of management. If you see that management basically wants to spend its time reaching in the shareholders' pockets and putting it in their pockets, that's a big warning sign. Um, and then I think over time you can see, you know, how has management behaved? You know, have they done sensible acquisitions, sensible divestitures? Um, and so there's a tremendous amount. And then today, because of you know, the World Wide Web, you can look at you know, management presentations really easily. So you don't have to go you know, to Saskatoon you know, in, in February 
you know, you, <laughs> you know, you, you, you can, you know, and you can see, and you, and you can see, you know, do, does what management says make sense? And I think ultimately what this business is about beyond the intellectual framework and the valuation work is judgment. And if in your personal judgment, you don't, there's something that doesn't smell right or it just doesn't click, there's 10,000 other companies in the world you can go buy. And um, so I think that that's, that's the key thing, I mean, is to be able to think independently. And if something doesn't make sense, don't do it. You know. And there's a lot of, a lot of companies that have uh, used um, aggressive accounting over the years, to say the least. And, you know, I remember reading the Enron Annual, and I just couldn't understand what they did. And, you know, it, it was a very popular security at the time. People loved it, but I just didn't understand the business. Now, I had no idea what was really going on, but it just, it just didn't, I couldn't understand it. And the other thing you could do is read the footnotes. Footnotes, you know, you know, the companies bury all kinds of stuff in the footnotes. And if there are things in there, if it's written in a way that you can't understand it, if you can't understand it and you're in this class, it probably means your average IQ is very high, then that's another warning sign. So I think there's a lot that's in the public domain. Yes, sir. You know, I think it, it comes back a little bit to the question, you know, up on the top row, is, you know, you've got to believe that these companies are behaving to the highest standards. And, um, and, and you know, the world is becoming a smaller and smaller place. And now you're going to have, you know, international accounting standards. Um, you know, do they use one of the big accounting firms? You know, how do they behave? Um, and you know, these are all factors that, um, and, th and if there's a country in which we don't believe has a good legal system, we don't want to be involved. And you know, this is one of the reasons also that Canada, you know, is such a fabulous place to do business, is that you have a proper legal system here. No, really, I mean, it's, 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 uh, um, it functions, you know, well. And um, so I think the world is becoming a small place, but I think that the right thing to do is to look all over the planet. I think that's where the action is. And the funny thing today is it used to be the smartest people in the world were in North America. N now they're in all kinds of places, all kinds of great businesses. And so I think you have to have that open mind. Okay, here we go. Okay, what is the, the biggest lesson you learned in uh, investing in life for the last 30 years? I, I think the, the biggest investing in life is to just keep going and, you know, to, to stay focused and, you know, to work hard and, um, you know, that the principles do work. It doesn't happen always instantly. Um, and that, um, you know, the world is a fascinating place. I think in terms of investing, I really thoroughly believe that you've got to be in, you've got to have this trifecta. You've got to have a business with improving economics. You've got to have people who, no matter where they are in the world, their objectives are to make the shareholders more money. And then you've got to get a, pr a cheap price. And if you have those three things, despite you know, opportunity costs, you know, stylistic issues, over time, you should do very well. And um, so I, I thoroughly believe in that, George.